This lesson deals with resonance. You can find these notes in the ECE 202 ebook in chapter 8 starting on page 36. In our last video we looked at an RLC circuit and plotted its magnitude and angle of various voltages and currents versus frequency. There was something unusual happening around 400 Hz. For example, the magnitude of the current, I sub L, increased and decreased as we varied the frequency of V sub S from 318.31 Hz to 3.1831 kHz. Now the magnitude of V sub S is constant, and so if the current that's coming in from the voltage source is changing, that means that the impedance must be changing with frequency. And of course it can because of the inductance and the capacitance. So let's find the equivalent input impedance to our circuit from example 810. Let's start with the right hand side that you've got R and a C in parallel. Remember the impedance of a capacitor is 1 over J omega C and the impedance of the inductor is J omega L. So we'll take the product over the sum R times 1 over J omega C over R plus 1 over J omega C. Let me multiply numerator and denominator by J omega C. So I just have an R in the numerator, J omega C R plus J omega C times this would just be equal to 1. Let's multiply numerator and denominator by the complex conjugate. In other words, take the opposite sign that's here. So it'll be minus J omega C R plus 1, and the same thing in the numerator. So when you multiply the denominator here, we're going to get omega C R squared. The J squared is equal to minus 1, and we have an additional minus sign, so we get a plus sign. And then we have 1 times 1, and then the inner products here, this times this, is exactly the same as this, but the opposite sign. And that's guaranteed because of this taking the complex conjugate and that we're putting a minus sign here. So when we multiply this times this, we get exactly the same as we have here, but with the opposite sign. So a purely real denominator. The numerator, we have r times 1, and then we have r times minus j omega cr, so we get an r squared there. Okay, now let's add the series inductance, which is j omega l. So I have a real part here, which is going to repeat over here, and my imaginary part is this negative term, plus now omega l. So I have a real part, and I have an imaginary part. What you can note here is that the real part does change with frequency, but is always positive. And then the term here, the imaginary term, can be positive, or negative, or zero, depending on the value of frequency. When the imaginary part is equal to zero, our Z equivalent is purely resistive. The frequency in which this occurs is called the resonant frequency. Actually, many textbooks don't get this right. One of the reasons I picked the companion textbook for these class notes was because of this example. Many textbooks pick the resonant frequency where you get a peak in the response. That can happen, but it doesn't always happen. In fact, in this example, it doesn't. And that's, again, one of the reasons why I like this textbook, because they really understand the meaning of resonant frequency. This will become very important when we do wireless circuits in ECE 404. Let's take that imaginary part and let's set it equal to zero. Now this occurs at usually only one frequency, so we'll call that equal to omega naught. I'm going to plug in omega equals omega naught into that term for the imaginary part. So here's where omega was, and here's where omega, and here's omega, and I'm just going to replace that by omega naught. So let's find the frequency where this imaginary term vanishes. Put this on the other side of the equation so it's positive. The omega naughts cancel here, and then I can bring this on this side of the equation and bring the L over here. So I'm left with R squared C divided by L, and then 1 plus the quantity omega naught RC squared. Put the 1 on the other side of the equation, and then I'm going to divide through by R squared C squared. I get some cancellation here. This term cancels with this, and I cancel with one of the powers of C. And so I'm left with 1 over LC, and then minus 1 over the quantity RC squared. So I'll take the square root of both sides of the equation, and the frequency where the imaginary term drops out is equal to this. So if we had a 250 millihenry inductor, a 0.5 microfarad capacitor, and a 3K resistor, we could calculate the value of omega naught. We tend to work in hertz in labs, so let's divide by 2 pi, or pull a 2 pi out of here, and I get 437.475 hertz. That is the resonant frequency. A lot of people with an RLC circuit will always say it resonates at 1 over the square root of LC, but that doesn't always happen. In this case, you can clearly see that that's not the case. At or near resonance, currents will be entering the circuit that are nearly its maximum value. And that'll produce maximum voltage magnitudes in our circuit. Another interesting point to note is we had a 100 volt cosine function as our input. That was the magnitude of our phaser, but we're producing voltages that were as large as 427.213 volts. And this occurred at a frequency of 444.478. That's just shown below here. And this is one of the interesting things about resonant. You can produce voltage is greater than the magnitude of what you're putting in. When you look at the power in and the power out, we're not getting anything for free here. We can step the voltage up, but what will happen is the current will go down. 
So when we calculate the power absorbed by our network, it'll equal the power generated at every instant in time, whether we're in the frequency domain or in the time domain. This type of a curve is also called a band pass curve, where we have a band of frequencies that pass through our circuit and a band of frequencies that basically don't. We'll talk some more about this in chapter 12. These are some of the concepts of resonance. 